morning, church. Good to see you guys. We had three wonderful days of Sabbathing back to back, and I've got most of my voice back. I hope you're healthy. We want to be praying. There's a lot of flu going around. Anybody had a family member that's had it in the last couple of months? And we got several at home. We're praying for you. We've got a lot of people. And uh, whew, flu round number two. Today, we culminate the Reignite series. The last five weeks, we've been going through this, looking at ways to reignite our passion and how do we live a life of balance and peace in a world that is trying to do everything but give you peace. It's trying to give you anything but balance, right? It's trying to take away your passion in such a broken and hurting world. And it has all been leading up to this beautiful question today. What would it look like if our lives were more simple? What would it look like if we could find contentment by being exactly in the moment where we are, with what God has given you, with your family, with your provision level, oh, now we're meddling, what would it look like if we were people whose lives resembled the master? Because we're in this world with constant motion and wanting the spotlight and accolades and always doing more and filling up our schedule with more and more stuff just to feel alive or meaningful. And I just want to know, if we look at the life of the master, what would happen if our professional life was simpler, or our personal life was simpler, or even our spiritual life? If we stayed off the rat race and we focused on Jesus, because when you look at his character, you will be drawn to the idea of simplicity. There's no escaping it. You will be drawn to his contentment and his quiet, beautiful, holy living. And it is a rare thing to see that today. Now, some people have gone to one extreme, and they've gone to decluttering and all kinds of stuff. They've sold the whole planet off, and they've tried to cram their family of seven in one of them little greenhouses, like five by like seven feet. You know what I'm talking about? That's extreme. Crazy, cool, admirable if you can do it. I'm not talking about that today. What I'm talking about is something a little bit more like Jennifer Wisham is doing. If you've been following Jennifer or Ryan there, he's already laughing in the sound booth. <laughs> they have been going through this process of streamlining of cutting down on the clutter and simplifying the life. And I think they are killing it. They're doing an awesome job. In fact, I asked permission if I could just show a couple of their Facebook posts. Now, let's just go to January 13th. This is Jennifer. So happy the downstairs is totally decluttered. Taking another load to Goodwill. Another, remember that. That implies there's already been some, okay? Taking another load to Goodwill and to the dump tomorrow. This weekend, we'll be decluttering the whole upstairs. I love that we've decided to try to live a more minimalist lifestyle. Good for her. That's awesome. So we think, okay, what is that, January 13th? Let's fast forward, Ryan, what we got? Three days later, January 16th. Is there anything better than getting rid of stuff and cleaning out the car? Oh, see, now it's gone into the car. I think those are my two favorite cleaning things. Look, even Priscilla's giving her thumbs up right there. And ten others. You know, that's awesome. Okay, so she's got three whole days down of getting this simplicity. You know, maybe it's because the Lord lit a fire in her and she's reading. Ryan, are we done? Is there more? Three days later. I'm very excited. We were able to give about eight bags to Goodwill and three pieces of furniture. Ooh, did you know that, Ryan? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and to take about six bags to the dump. Upstairs looks nice and open. Now, I want you all to notice her husband's comment down here. <laughs> Laugh out loud, y'all. Make no mistake, that is nervous laughter. <laughs> that is ner you know it is. He's like, <laughs> eight more bags, honey? What we got? Well, surely we're done. Surely we are done. Is there anything else, Brian? What we got here? Oh, my goodness, we're still not done. Okay, think this is the last load to donate. Minimal lifestyle feels amazing. Well, that's pretty good. Surely we're done now. <laughs> this has to be it. The car's full. Ryan, we got anything else? What else we got? Yesterday and today, I talked Ryan into straightening the garage up. Somehow, I talked him into throwing away stuff and making another goodwill pile. Hashtag winning. <laughs> Wife talks hubby into stuff. <laughs> so I got to thinking. I thought, you know what? I need to be a good pastor. I need to check on Ryan. <laughs> I need to check on him. Make sure he's doing okay. Make sure that, that nervous laughter, that LOL... Just, you know, how's he doing? So I did what every good Christian does. I went to his Facebook page. Here's what I found. I am so happy Goodwill doesn't take husbands. 
Doesn't take husbands. 49 likes. But notice the comments. 14. So I get Amy. I grab a bowl of popcorn. We're going to read the comments. So we scroll down. Ryan, show us the first comment here. Did your wife try to donate you or something? (laughs) Not yet, but she's donating everything else. I thought, this is getting so good. Surely we're done with the simplifying, the minimalizing. And then I said, there's got to be one more comment. I found it. Ryan, what you got? Hey, you remember that scene from Twister where the guy lashes himself to the pipe from getting sucked up in the imminent tornado? That's you, Ryan, from the sounds of things. And there it is. This is how we feel when we simplify. We think, oh, I can't do that. I can't let go. I, I got to hold these things. And then I found this great article called Five Reasons Why You Need a Simple Life, Why You Need a Quiet Life by a guy named Neil Samadre. I butcher this name. Sam, Samadre. Su, Sumadre. <laughs> That's your mother in Spanish, isn't it? Suma, Sumadre. <laughs> we'll just call him Neil by Neil S. And he was quoting the verse we're looking at today in Thessalonians. That verse that says, make it your goal to live a quiet life. Make it your goal to mind your own business, work hard with your hands, just as we instructed you. And then he went on to write this. This is so good. He says, several years ago, I favored a bold and extreme life. I looked at celebrity culture and I dreamed of having my own writing blog go big and hit the big time. I wanted a professional and personal life that was thrilling and exciting, allowing me to travel, see the world, meet new people, and stay in a constant state of motion. But, there's always a but, this was also around the same time I was introduced to Jesus. And as I read through the Gospels and studied Jesus, my desire for this bold life began to unravel is so good. The truth I couldn't ignore was that Jesus lived the vast majority of his life in simplicity and being quiet. In fact, for his 33 years, for three decades of those, 30 years, he didn't even have a raging public ministry. He was probably a simple carpenter who didn't like the spotlight. He didn't seek it. He only wanted to work hard, please his heavenly father, and do good. He desired a simple life, before his public ministry even got off the ground. So I thought about that. If I want to be like the master, then my life needs to reflect the master. And what motivates him and what gets his schedule going is what mine should look like. I'm supposed to emulate this, and I started thinking about this, and then it hit me. We make things way harder than they should be. You know? In other words, the truth is, life should be simpler than we make it out to be. That's the truth of it. Life should be simpler than we make it out to be. A lot of the stress, can can we just be honest? A lot of the stress in our life comes from us. When we load our plate up with so many things, like a smorgasbord, I want some of that, I want some of that, I want some of that. And God's like, you sure? Because I got this for you to do. And like, if your plate is so jammed full of stuff that you could do nothing for him when he calls, you've put stuff on your plate he didn't give you. And we're all guilty of that, especially in America, where we're so blessed We're so fat, happy, and content. Well, we don't have godly contentment. But we're so blessed. I think we've become lethargic. Now, hear me. I'm not saying we got to shun all modern conveniences, okay? Like that great commercial years ago from the settlers. We don't have to become this guy, right? Where he's looking like, hello, Brother Elliot. How are you today? I'm good, Jebediah. Just churning the butter, planting the corn, waiting for a fertile spring. You know, it's not, I'm not talking about that. But I am saying If we don't watch our life and emulate Jesus' quiet, simple life, then we allow things to creep in. Things begin to slither in like a silent boa constrictor, and they very quietly and insidiously start to circle you and do this. You don't even realize it's happening. And it can be stuff that's insidious, stuff you don't even realize, things that the world says is good, like ambition. Well, go get them, boy. Go take the world by the tail and have a good time and, you know, do your thing. Nothing wrong with that unless it's self-seeking ambition. A lot of times I think we forget to check in with the creator. Say, God, is this your will? Because I said I surrender all, and then I go and I do my own thing. And I never check in with the master. And I think these, these things come in and they start to strangle us, this constant desire for more 
and allowing others to dictate what's important, allowing others to dictate our schedule and seeking constant motion and all of this endless striving is hijacking our health and our sanity. And I wonder if maybe that isn't what God had in mind for us as believers. You ever see somebody that's just dripping with peace when they walk in? You just see the joy of the Lord on their face? Like, man, that's awesome. I want some of that. You could tell they've been with the Father. And when we don't do that, man, it ages us. We look like we've been baptized in prune juice and just lost our best friend. And we age, and I, I found this great meme. It reminds me so much of this. Who says life is hard? I'm 34. I feel great. <laughs> so if you're, if you're on the fence, or maybe you're intrigued with the thought of a quieter, or more content and simpler life, I want to share with you from God's Word some strategies and four things that I learned from looking at Jesus. Open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the New King James Version today for the most part, the NKJV. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us. I know a lot of you are sick. Thank you. God bless you for keeping your germs there. Feel better and then come join us. And if you're a guest in the big room today, a special welcome to you. Thank you for being here. We know it takes a lot of effort to get the kids and everybody up here. You make our services better. And we are genuinely thrilled to have you. I hope you already feel that warmth. There's something special here. All right. Did I give you enough time? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's follow along starting at verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. There it is. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase in that more and more that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly. Watch this. That you may walk properly toward those who are in the church. Doesn't say that, does it? To those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. I love this. I studied that. I always want to dig deeper and see these other translations, see what happens. Check out how the message says it this week. It says, regarding life together and getting along with each other, you don't need me to tell you what to do. You're God taught on these matters. Just love one another. I love that. Love God, love people, right? You're already good at it. Your friends all over Apex are the evidence. Oh, sorry. Macedonia are the evidence. Keep it up, but get better and better at it. I love verse 11. Stay calm. Mind your own business, do your own job. You've heard all of this from us before, but a reminder never hurts. We want you living in a way that will command the respect of outsiders. Not lying around, sponging off your friends. Mm -mm -mm. I love that last line. So if you're 39 years old and you are still mooching off your friends or living in your mom's basement playing Dungeons and Dragons all day, Paul might be saying, just a thought, not judging. You just might want to look at this. Paul is giving some practical instructions for living a holy and a simple life. And he's saying, we need to walk properly in front of the lost world. How in the world do we expect them to want what we have if what we have isn't even attractive to us? If we are always spastic and frantic and rushing from one thing to the next. And then he goes on to say, outside the church. Those people outside should see us as Christians, people of integrity. The actual translation says it literally, your life should literally inspect, be inspected by lost people like a magnifying glass and be able to withstand their inspection because your life is so genuine and you are living a life of holiness. Not perfection, but at least displaying authentic faith. They're looking for people who lead a quiet life, who don't stir up conflict, who aren't busy about it, don't have their nose in everybody's business. And they live peacefully, even in the middle of their stress. Even when your week is going horribly, how do you stack up? Paul says you can't be walking with God in holiness and be a troublemaker. Peter echoes this too. Check out this verse right here in 1 Peter 4. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody, and other... Wait, wait, what? <laughs> Look at those sins he's listing here. Murderer, thief, evildoer... Busybody. Be honest, none of you saw that word being in that same sentence. But look what he puts it in. No wonder it's so precious. So much is written about living a quiet and holy life. Next week's our 17-year anniversary. We've got a couple people that are possibly coming back 
to celebrate with us. It'll be confirmed tomorrow. I'm not trying to be coy or say anything, but there's going to be some neat people going to be here. One of them I was talking to is the great pastor, Dr. Rumley. And as I was talking with him years ago, we were talking about the state of the world and how culture just seems to be spiraling quicker and quicker into you name it. And I said, look at Jesus' life. We started talking about this, and he said, you know, one of the reasons Jesus was able to lead such a simple life was this simple thing. He said, Jesus held things loosely. You never see him grasping for things or clinging tightly to anything except his heavenly father, except his love for people. And that's the example for us. So as you look at the life of Jesus, here's the four things I want to leave with you today. The first one is this. A simple life helps you live with contentment and peace. I love those words, contentment and peace. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we all want? A life of contentment and peace? Godliness with contentment is great gain. But what so often happens is we allow these seemingly harmless things like self-motivated ambition to direct our days and our schedules, and it starts to complicate our life. We start to have the slow accumulation of excess and greed, and things begin to bog us down, and the stress and complexity of our life begins to do this. And guess what? Suddenly we are no longer able to have our hands open for the Lord. You know why? Because we're so jammed full of our own stuff. We've got so much on our own plate. What if God did call and say, I need you to go minister to that person? Can you even do it? God, I'm here, I'm all yours, but I can't, I've got this, I've got this, and you know, I need you to go bless out. Well, I can't because I'm so overextended, I'm so in debt, I've got credit card. I can't even bless somebody and take them out for a meal. I, I can't. What do we do when we're so swamped with our own stuff, we're not even available to the Creator? We can no longer hear His voice. We can't hear the call of the Creator over the clamor of the crowd. It's like a roaring din, and this is why you see so many unhappy celebrities the super rich and the mega famous, they think that if they finally achieve this status, they're going to be happy. And we think, oh man, they've got it made. If I could just have this, if I could just achieve this level of fame, it's almost like a mirage. You ever seen these in the desert? If I could just have this job, if I could just earn this level of income, if I could just date that person, if I would just be able to marry that person, if my kids could only get into that school and you go and you're panting because you're endlessly striving with stuff that didn't come from God, it's our own made things, and we come and finally we get to where we think the water is just within reach, and guess what it turns out to be? Sand. And that promise of cool, refreshing water is gone. And I hate sand. <laughs> it's coarse and rough and here it gets everywhere. Not sure that that was a Star Wars reference for those of you who are wondering what that was. We see this all the time, church. We see it in good people. Even people who finally get what they always wanted. Somebody who wins the lottery or the sweepstakes. It's called sudden wealth syndrome. You know, it's a thing. They actually get it and we go and we check on them a year or two later and they're worse than they were before because they've spiraled down into this depression or paranoia because they've got their thing, and like, mine, 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 and they want to protect it, my precious, it's mine. And suddenly they've got family members that they've never met, and friends, and I'm, hey, best friend, buddy, old pal, can I have some? And they come out of the woodwork, and they don't know who to trust anymore. We see the suicide rates for people like that, from sudden wealth, and it just blows our minds. We think, wow, I mean, I'd like to try if I could handle some sudden wealth. Maybe I could give it a go, but do you really want that? Because God says, if you're faithful with a little, he'll trust you with more. But if you're not even faithful with what he's given you, why do we expect more? My son comes to me, and he blows through the $10 I just gave him. He puts it on the most wasteful, what I think is silly stuff. And he comes back and says, that was great. Dad, can I have some more? I'm like, well, what'd you do? What I gave you? You bought 47 little peeps, those little marshmallow things? That's what you spent your money on? Okay, no, you can't have more. (laughs) A quiet life, a simple life, helps us structure our world according to the values of Scripture. When that happens, you're no longer a victim to what other people think. You're no longer under those chains, these outside shallow pursuits. Let's stop treating life like it's some endless bucket list where we cross off one thing and we race to the next thing. We cross that off, we race to the next thing, and we find ourselves panting like a dog out of breath, and we just don't understand why we have no peace. 
And we just go from one thing. Instead, how about we concentrate on the master's goal where he demonstrated contentment and gratitude. I heard Pastor Bill teaching through the wall today in the, in the small group room when I was in my study. One of the things they were talking about was this very thing. Did you wake up this morning and have a hot shower? Man, that, that used to be a big deal. We used to think that we would never have that till the last hundred years. Did you have food in the closet, in the pantry? Did you have clothes to wear? Your kids alive and breathing? Are they here? I mean, it's just like we don't even think of these things that they're so, so important to stop and be grateful, which leads us to number two. A simple life allows us fewer things to distract us from what really matters. Because when you boil it down, a bold and extreme, wide-open, adrenaline-chasing life is almost always guided by a never-ending quest for more. And you know people like this. Maybe you are on that trap, that that merry-go-round, that gerbil wheel where you're just going. But here's the reality. It's always impossibly just beyond our grasp. People clawing at the ladder of success or sacrificing their families and their kids, never seeing them because they always want to do more or be more. But that's an illusion. Jesus showed up in Matthew chapter 6. He says, guys, come on. Life is more than worrying about what to eat, what to wear, what kind of house you'll live in, what kind of jobs you're going to have. The pagans run after all those things. Does your heavenly father not take care of the, the lilies and the birds and feed that? You don't have to worry about that. And then in 1 Timothy, Paul echoes this same truth. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We certainly can bring nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing with these, we should be content. Wow. How you doing with that, church? How are you doing with that, America? That's where the rubber meets the road. When God's will becomes the dominant voice in our lives, when we quit playing patty cake with the Savior, and we actually practice what we preach, and we say, I am not going to give in to the distractions and the shiny trinkets trying to get me off my path. God, I gave you my all and I meant it. My time, my treasure, my talents. And we focus on that. Those chains are broken and you're free. The Greek word that's used here for contentment is atarkeia. It is an incredible, powerful word that means to be fully satisfied and happy with how you are at any given time. At any given time. Man, that's the goal. What an awesome, lofty goal. But that, isn't that why you're here? Right? It's not just to get a sugar-coated little pat on the hiney, woo we're great. But it's to challenge that, guys, when you focus on Christ, the sacrifice is real. He gave it all. And here's the bonus thing. When you, when you fall in love with Christ and he becomes your standard, guess what else happens? You get a bonus benefit. You get less disappointment, less worry, less stress from all these silly things that don't matter anymore. How cool is that? Remember, two weeks ago, we talked about what it meant to rest in him. Enjoying a true biblical day of rest, a 24-hour block of period that is just for you and the Lord for replenishment, for focusing on him and your family. Not a day to catch up. It's not a day. It's not your catch-up day to work harder. That misses the whole point. It is a full 24-hour stop and cease your labor and enjoy resting in him. And it's this beautiful gift that he gives us. And we say, thanks, but no thanks. He's saying, you need to go to bed. You need to rest. And it reminds me of this great meme that is so perfect. I love this. Going to bed early, not leaving my house, not going to a party, my childhood punishments. These are my adult goals now. This is what I want to do. Please tell me I have to go to bed early. Please tell me I don't have to go to that party, please. Yet we say, no thanks. It's incredible. And we looked at what it meant to truly take a Sabbath. And I asked all of us, what kind of God do your neighbors see when they look at you? Do they see a God of peace and joy and simplicity? Or do they see a burdensome God? One who never lets his children rest. One who is always sending his kids on constant motion, racing through life in a blur of endless busyness. Because I'll be honest, the older I get, the less I want that. Some of our senior adults in here are nodding. Because they know life is flying. Days are going by. And they could tell you 
if they could go back and do it again, they wouldn't waste half the stress and emotional energy on stuff that didn't matter. We get so distracted, which leads us to the next thing. A simple life helps you invest in relationships. Oh, so important. Too often we let our careers or ambition dominate our life. Y'all, we're not lost people. We're not supposed to live like the world. We're supposed to be called apart, separate, and say, we live a life of holiness. We want to live different. We want people to look at us and say, there's something different about you. There is. Can I tell you about Jesus? And they're supposed to see this. But I think sometimes we blend in so much, they can't even tell us apart. At school, at work. I'm not talking about your language or the words you use or if you're having a Heineken or something. I'm not talking about little trivial stuff on the side. I'm talking about the way we love people, the way we serve others. So many things that fill up our days, y'all. Soon we blink and we say, what happened? This Friday, we've got the daddy-daughter dance. I want to show you how quick life is flying by. This is us, my, my oldest daughter, 2013. The very first daddy-daughter dance. That's 2014. I want you to look at where she is. Back in these days, she could stand on my feet if she didn't know how to do it, and we could dance like this, and her head would be right here. Fast forward to the next two years, 2015, 2016. You see a trend here? A little girl's growing up. Fast forward to 2017. Okay, that's just weird. That's just... <laughs> That guy is way too happy to have hair. I can see it up there. <laughs> and fast forward to last year. We have the masquerade and then 2019. She's here. One of the last songs we sing, that they play before we know the night's about to be over, is Dancing with Cinderella. Incredible song. It talks about how she used to come home and she would do this and that. She would grow older and older and then comes to the chorus and says, so I will dance with Cinderella while she is here in my arms, because soon the clock will strike midnight, she'll be gone. My life's flying. It's flying by. This is a challenge to me as a father, as a husband, as a pastor. Focus on what truly matters. Cut out all this stuff. Create that margin so you can give the people who mean the most your best instead of coming home so beat up and burnt out that you're giving the most important people leftovers. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He is our example. We don't have to do the endless rat race. Hear me. You're free from that. Not from me. Jesus said you're free from that. Don't let the world put that on you. That's not yours to pick up, Ricky Bobby. You let that go. You be about your father's business, which leads us to the last one. A quiet and simple life stands out just as much as a loud life. Man, that is so deep, especially today in this world of endless chaos where everything is so frantic and fast-paced. The only thing I want loud in my life is my love. My love for my Lord, my love for my wife, my love for my kids, my love for my church. That's it. It's the only thing I want. Well, I want Striper loud. I do want that. If I'm, if I'm lifting weights or something, I want a, a loud CD. The only two things I want loud are my love and Striper. So you can have two. You pick two things, okay? Pastoral decree. That's all I want. We have so much busyness and we have so many things. Today's culture, there's so many people who are simply over busy because they've let somebody else set their agenda. So take a moment. And pause and ask yourself this question. Who is setting your agenda right now? Who's in the driver's seat? Is it somebody else? Is it the Lord? Is it you? Who's behind the wheel? I mean, it's your life. You get to decide who sits there. I get to decide who sits there in my life. That's, that's the, the admonition, y'all. Maybe, listen, if God's calling you to some bold extreme thing where you're just going crazy and it's fanatic and these extreme things in his name and you know he's calling you to do, go for it. Do it with God's blessing and don't look back. But never forget there's another lifestyle that's just as bold, just as radical, just as extreme. Maybe, just maybe, God is calling you to a radical life of obedience and simplicity. 
and blooming right where he's got you and loving people right there, making a profound and meaningful difference in the life right around you. Because here's your truth grenade. You ready for it? Because after all, Jesus did this. He was fully pleasing to the Father by living 95% of his life in relative seclusion. Let that sink in. 30 of his 33 years, he was content to be obedient to his father, to be probably a simple carpenter, we assume, not caring about a name for himself, not out having some raging ministry. 95% of his life, because he rose above the noise and the stress, he knew an unbalanced life was not what the father had for him. And you can have that too. You can rise above it. In fact, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and have the instruments come up. And while they come up and get in place, I want to show you a picture. See if you can tell me what this is right here. Does anyone recognize this? Yeah? What is it? The Concorde. Flew for 24 years before the big accident. Anyone have a family member? Anyone know anyone who ever flew on this? Incredible. Most planes, commercial airliners, jetliners, fly four, five, six hundred miles an hour tops. This is almost triple that. Faster than the speed of sound. Supersonic. What it used to take seven hours to cross, now they could do in half that time. But here's the thing. Commercial airliners would fly at 28 to 35,000 feet. This one didn't fly at 35,000 feet or 45,000 feet or 55,000 feet. This would fly at 60,000 feet. And one of the things, if you ever talk to somebody who rode on it, they would say not only was the trip fast because of the thin air and because they could go so much faster, the cool part was the unknown benefit. And it was they would all say the same thing when they got off the, the, the plane. Can't believe how smooth the ride was. You ready for this? You know why? Because when they rose above all that junk in the atmosphere, it was smooth. There was no turbulence. When they flew above that, they couldn't believe at this higher altitude how smooth the ride was, not to mention how close to heaven <laughs> they felt. Jesus rose above all the noise of an unbalanced life. We've been talking about this for five weeks Jesus is calling us to live our life at a higher altitude, above the noise, above the clamor and the clutter and the distractions and all these things that are robbing us of our peace and our passion and our purpose. God wants that for you. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and troubled, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke, my burden's light. I won't put anything ill-fitting on you. I read just this past week of a beautiful three-year-old girl named Allie. Allie is just beginning to grasp the English language and form these incredible, adorable sentences. She continues to mix up two words, the word never and the word ever. And it's adorable. Her mom says, for instance, she will come up and say, Mama, this is the bestest day I never saw. And her mom will smile and doesn't even bother correcting her. She says, I cherish her ability to live so fully in the present to find such joy and delight in everyday moments. One day we're walking out in the summer sun, and she stops and she shows me every single flower and every cloud formation and every bug and bird. And she's going around and she loudly declares, this is the bestest day I never saw. One warm summer day, she watched her dance from sprinkler to sprinkler while she was pulling weeds. She'd go grab these dandelions, she would run all over the yard and she would do this with him, and all the white billy seeds would go drifting off. She'd just watch her laugh. And she'd come up and say, Mama, this is the bestest day I never saw. They go in for lunch, and they start making her favorite chicken pasta meal, and her little girl, Allie, pulls up the chair, stands on it next to the island, puts her hand on her shoulder and says, Isn't this the bestest day we never saw, Mama? Then it happened. That night, her mom, not having the best day, she sees this mountain of laundry. Oh, I can testify. <laughs> she sees this mountain of laundry, dirty clothes that she's got to wash. And she, with her bad attitude, slams down the thing and she starts sorting them out by colors without missing a beat. Allie runs up to her 
and starts helping her, putting the reds over here and the whites over here, just going through the dirty laundry, and she proudly exclaims, Mama, don't you think this is the bestest day we never saw? And that's when it clicked. She writes, right there, my understanding sharpened. And it hit me. She associates our togetherness and simple everyday doings as something to celebrate wildly and completely. There it is. Oh, to have the eyes and heart of a child to see such beautiful, uncluttered simplicity. What a gift. We have that. Jesus says, unless you come like a child, you're going to miss this. What about you? What's God ta talking to you? What's he, what's he tugging at your heart now? Is there something you need to give? Something that's cluttered? Something that's been choking your peace? Like that boa constrictor? We're going to open up the altar in just a minute. Just come lay it down before him. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the power of your word and the truth of watching your example when you took human form and walked our planet. Thank you for showing us that you're never hurried, you're never out of time. You're never frantic. You are the Prince of Peace. And I'm so glad you give us the privilege to know you. Lord, in this moment, would you help us to just check our baggage at the foot of your cross? To just drop the clutter, the distractions, the nonsense, the stress, the things that are pulling us a thousand different directions and bring it all back to you. Thank you for giving us the privilege to do that. You're so good, so good. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.